John, listen, I'm not taking any work calls right now. I'm about to see my daughter. I'll call you after seven. Okay, bye. Guess it's not coming, Ruby. I'm sorry. All right, all right. I'm here to see Ruby for lunch. She's already eaten. What are you talking about? I have a court order right here. It says 1 p.m. Yes, Ricky, that says 1 p.m., not 1 10 p.m. So, what is your point? There was a lot of traffic on the road. Give me a break. You know, if you really cared about Ruby, you would be here on time. You know I love her and I would do anything for her, Simi. Tell that to the judge. Wait, hold on. Let me at least give her her present I got her. Bye. Damn it. Hi, I'm Hardy Dillon and today is April 25th, which also marks Parental Alienation Awareness Day. It is a chance for us to educate parents and children alike about the effects of parental alienation, which can sometimes be very devastating. The definition of parental alienation on Wikipedia is the process by which a child is estranged from a parent through so psychological manipulation from the parent to the child. And here at Equal Parenting for Children organization, we are happy to work against this cause to support equal parenting for children because every child deserves both parents. And on the board of directors, we have Wendy Robinson, who will be speaking tonight. We have Denny Consuelo Liana, myself, Sylvester, Linda, Caleb, Richard, and Zoli, who have all worked together to put this presentation together for you. So uh, I want to give everyone a big round of applause and uh, thank everyone for the teamwork involved because without them, this presentation would not be possible. And that uh, thanks is also extended to our guest speakers. It was such like a, a tug of war with whose side are you going to choose? I realized like it was just tearing me apart. It was always, you're on my side or you're dead to me. The first time my dad saw me, I was in my grandma's arms in a courtroom. It really felt like she didn't want anything to do with me. It's hard when you have to stop and think that your child wants nothing to do with you because of what they've been taught. One parent gets to be a parent and the other gets to be, at best, a visitor and at worst, completely erased. And a lot of it has to do with our judicial system. What I remember about being in court was having to lie to the judge. Sorry. It destroys lives, it bankrupts people every day, it tears children from their homes, and just so happens to be a $50 billion a year industry. If you don't pay your child support, you're gonna go to jail. Walter Scott decided to bolt from his car. Court documents show he owed more than $18,000 in child support payments. These fathers are not dead beat, they're dead broke. Nothing I said mattered. None of the evidence I brought forward mattered. The judge wouldn't even look at it. He's nothing like I was told he was. If there's 22 million adults dealing with this, that's over 22 million children. And the mental health consequences are severe and long-lasting. It's heartbreaking to me to see how many of you are dealing with this. My dad was erased from my life. It's happening all over the world. This isn't a father's rights issue. It's not a mother's rights issue. It's a human right issue. My daughter here and I have been alienated from each other for the majority of her life. She called me and said, Dad, it's time to move home, and she came home. 
If the court worked in a way where there was 50-50 custody, I'd be happier. I wouldn't feel a void because I've never known a life where one parent wasn't missing. A new bill would make default custody 50-50. How come we don't have shared parenting in the law? It's called special interests. We need more clarity in law to support what is best for children, shared parenting, and this helps move in that direction. I want to show people that it can have a happy ending. In about 10 minutes, we're going to leave for the courthouse so I can legally readopt my daughter. So we have seven guest speakers for you tonight, and I'm excited to hear what they have to say. We have Rudy Cazetto, he is the MPP for the PC party representing the Mississauga Lakeshore riding. We also have Glenn Sheridan, he's the president of the Equal Parenting Council. Right. Jean Coleman is a family lawyer and a published author, favorably cited by the Supreme Court of Canada, and he's also an avid thought leader for the area of equal parenting. We have Jenna Noble, who's co-parenting and reunification coach, consultant and mediator. We have Wendy Robinson, who is an active board member for Equal Parenting for Children organization, and Robert Samari, who is an active board member for the Parental Alienation Awareness organization, and he also worked with Savi Van Maris to introduce Parental Alienation Awareness Day, April 25th, in Canada. It's an honor to join you here this afternoon as your member of Provincial Parliament for Mississauga Lakeshore to raise awareness of parental alienation and how it affects Ontario children. On behalf of the Ontario government, thank you to you, my good friend, Mr. Cabarrus, and the members of Equal Parenting for Children for your hard work and dedication. When couples separate or divorce, their children lose access to religious, cultural, and their community. By helping families cope with parental alienation, we are making a significant contribution to build a stronger, vibrant and healthier community in Mississauga and across Ontario. Parental alienation is contributing to homelessness, crime, poverty and poor mental health outlook for both parents and their children. Mothers are also as likely as fathers to be impacted. Parental Alienation Awareness Day allows Ontario, including judges, lawyers and children protecting agencies to reflect on the negative impact that parental alienation has on the well-being of both parents and their children. Equal parenting for children play an important role in supporting all victims of parental alienation by working with communities, religious organizations to build a stronger family. Children and family re rely on agencies like Equal Parenting for Children for vital support. As part of our plan to make the communities healthier, our government is dedicating $11.5 million in capital fund for repairs and renovation in community agencies so that they can continue to deliver vital services for our community, especially now as families are more separated than ever. To help get families back together faster, our government took immediate action to fight COVID-19 with $17 billion action plan including $3.3 billion in support of our health care system and $3.7 billion to support our people, and jobs and families. This investment has also allowed us to open 1,000 additional acute care beds, 500 critical care beds and over 100 COVID-19 assessment centers, including one right here in Mississauga Lakeshore at the Trillium Health Partners to stop the spread of COVID-19. Though this funding will also doubled the guaranteed annual income system for 194,000 low-income seniors, providing $200 per child up to the age of 12 and $250 for those with special needs. Holding electricity prices to reduce off-peak rates will help as well, and offering six months of OSAP loan and interest relief for students, reducing financial pressures on our Ontario families. We also take an action to help victims of parenting alienation who are more isolated than ever by providing emergency funds of up to $12 million for online virtual mental health services. This fund will ensure that people continue to receive support, including families 
I look forward to seeing the positive impact that Equal Parenting for Our Children advocates are doing to help parents and their children build more inclusive living so that all can be welcomed into the community where they belong, regardless of their family's situation. So thank you very much for all you're doing for our communities. Hi, I'm Glenn Sheridan. I'm president of the Canadian Equal Parenting Council, and I'm here to ask you a question. If you found a way to change the world, would you do it? So here's my way. If, see if you follow my thinking. Changing the world is really about the future. The future is with our children. So how they're raised, good or bad, determines our future world. The social science here is settled. Having both parents in the lives of children is the biggest and best influence in making children into well-adjusted, successful, healthy, and capable adults. So here's my change the world claim. Ensure parents are parents to their children unless they are proven unfit. Kind of like innocent until proven guilty, the fundamental principle of our criminal justice system. So this is no wild, unrealistic idea, but matches best practices in other areas of society. Call it equal shared parenting or co-parenting. Now, what does this mean in practice? It means all parents, whether birth parents, adoptive parents, or separating parents, divorcing parents, have both rights and responsibilities to their children. The standards for unfitness must be clear and equal. We now have a system where the standard for losing your child in a child protection case is different from losing your child in divorce court and different again in an adoption case. The current system makes no sense is unequal, erratic, and not based on the abundant social science. To change the world, we need to change that. In practice, equal shared parenting means changing our adversarial legal system to a conflict resolution system, one that respects the balance of rights and responsibilities of parents. As an aside, I've never had a parent say to me after going through family court, well, I sure felt respected. In practice, equal shared parenting means ensuring that the phrase best interest of the child is real from the viewpoint of the child, not from the viewpoint of vested interests, ideologues, or biased advocates for sole custody. Co-parenting or equal shared parenting is good parenting. Parental alienation, on the other hand, is bad parenting. It's about as bad as it can get. So, what is parental alienation? Parental alienation is a family dysfunction, generally related to divorce or separation. When a child expresses unreasonably strong dislike or unjustified hatred for one parent, making access by the rejected or target parent difficult or impossible. The child's feelings may be induced by negative comments by the alienating parent. Often the rejected parent is baselessly accused of sexual, physical, or other abuse by the alienating parent or by the child. The terms related to parental alienation include child alienation, pathological alignments, access or visitation refusal, pathological alienation, toxic parenting, and hostile aggressive parenting. It is important to distinguish between real and imagined alienation and also between real and imagined abuse by verifying claims and investigating evidence. In 1998, I met Pamela Stewart Mills, who had one of the first parental alienation court cases in Canada. In his ruling in her case, Judge Gomery, a later of Gomery uh, Federal Inquiry fame, uh, the federal government corruption scandal, reversed custody because of parental alienation, stating, it is not natural that a parent hate a child. It has to be taught. So, parental alienation is not new. It goes back to the 1980s or before. It is not a theory of discredited academics, 
And it's not a backlash by men who wish to abuse their children or ex-wives, as has been claimed by vested interest. So a question, what is the solution to parental alienation? Well, parental alienation typically occurs because one parent seeks to drive the other parent out of a child's life or because one parent is given sole control and abuses parental responsibility to retain sole custody. If both parents are treated with equality and respect by courts and professionals and refrain from removing one parent from a child's life, it is more likely that both parents in a conflicted divorce can work through the vulnerable time of separation and remain as parents. Thus, the task of courts and professionals under an equal parenting presumption is to educate parents on conflict resolution skills and to move the parents to collaborative positions where they can negotiate their own solutions to problems, preferably with both mother and father equally parenting as far as practically possible. With an equal parenting presumption written into law and equality and respect enforced in the procedures, incentives for conflict are reduced, so the extremes of parental alienation can be moderated or eliminated in many, if not most, conflicted cases. Low to moderate cases of parental alienation can be prevented from escalating by non-adversarial best practices of equal shared parenting. The incentives should be that parents make their own decisions, that no parent is coerced into losing their children, that collaborative parenting is rewarded, and there are consequences for alienating children from the other parent. Severe cases of parental alienation often result from mental illnesses such as paranoia, obsessions, borderline personality disorders, or uncontrolled hatred or revenge against the target parent. In such extreme cases, parental alienation is child abuse, and removing custody from the alienating parent may be necessary to protect the child's relationship with the target parent and extended family. Equal shared parenting provides a best practices approach to stopping parental alienation. Here are some equal parenting working practices. Number one, every parent deserves an equal chance and should be accepted as emotionally vulnerable in the divorce process. Both parents need education about the divorce process, equal parenting, the needs of their children, and conflict resolution skills. The consequences of bad behavior, that is, parental alienation, and the incentives for good behavior, co-parenting, must be taught and enforced. Number three, upon recognition of alienating behavior, the alienating parent must be educated about the consequences and given a chance to change their behavior. Upon recognition of alienation, the target parent must be educated about how to deal with this abuse. Number five, upon recognition of severe and unchangeable parental alienation, the alienating parent must have severe consequences, including facing loss of custody, supervised access, etc. Generally, the severely abusive parent, often mentally ill, must still be offered limited chances to correct their behavior and potentially get back to being an equal parent to their child. We need to recognize parental alienation as child abuse. Fundamentally, all abuse is abuse of power. With equal shared parenting, both parents are equal in power and authority. Thus, conflict and abuse are lessened while parental authority is increased. Equal shared parenting is not ideological, but a pragmatic collection of best practices for dealing with parent conflicts. It is dealing with the emotional divorce with scientific and forensic analysis to determine the veracity of allegations which may arise. You probably know children and parents harmed by adversarial family separation. Let's imagine a future of equal shared parenting without parental alienation. Happier, healthier, more successful kids. Kids need both parents. That's a future worth working for. That's what I'm working for. Thank you.
He started school, he was younger than all of the other kids. The very first day of class, his teacher sent me home a letter saying, your child needs to be evaluated for ADHD. I see these tendencies. I said, I hope you do realize that he is only four years old. She proceeded over the course of a week to tell me every day that he couldn't keep still and that he was fidgety and that he couldn't keep his mouth shut. Your child needs to be on Ritalin is basically where she was headed. And I was just, I was so overwhelmed with disbelief. My child was diagnosed with ADHD by the school's principal. First, I was just like, wow, you know, because it came to us as a surprise because all we knew he was doing great in school. I just kept saying, look, don't, let's stop the conversation on medication because I don't believe in it, I won't do it. She then threatened me in the sense of telling me she used to be a child social worker and she's seen kids taken out of their homes for not going along with the diagnosis. The choices that the school gave me was either drug your child or your child will be taken. My son was three years old when he was diagnosed with ADHD, um, ODD, and possible bipolar. I totally trusted the doctor when I took him there. You know, I thought that he was a professional, he's gone to school for this. Because I worked with him, I thought he was a good doctor, I thought he knew what he was doing. So I went ahead and I put him on meds. He's been on Ritalin, he's been on Concerta, they put him on Paxil. I mean, we tried different drugs, different dosages, because each one that they would have him on would have a different side effect. My son was in elementary school, early second, third grade and the teachers were telling me he's very rambunctious and can't stay focused and I should consider getting him on medication for kids with ADHD. Um, I ignored it initially, but then I kept feeling the pressure come and come, so I thought, okay, maybe I need to do something. And I uh, took Jason to see a psychiatrist, and after one, two meetings, he was prescribed antidepressants and a drug for ADHD, Adderall. Immediately, within a couple of days, it took a toll on Jason. He, he, he was listless. He had no will for to, to eat, to communicate. And I did call the doctor and he said, oh, just lighten up the dosage and whatnot. But after not even a week, barely, I think it was like six days, he, I would say, attempted suicide. And I'm just like, oh my God, what's happening? The doctor's opinion was that my child needed to be on drugs to change his behavior. The court took my rights away from me based on the doctor's recommendation. My son's personality is completely different on the drugs and off the drugs. So on the drugs, he's not talking at all, um, quiet, um, lethargic, and angry, bitter bitter and angry um, and not eating and not growing. I was sick to my core. I, I couldn't believe that I had those rights taken away from me. I actually started working part-time at a vocational school and I had only been working there for two months and they said, we're gonna take the students on a field trip to the psychiatric museum. I was the only instructor to go with three classes of young adults, knowing nothing about the museum. So I came to the museum with this expectation and it was like halfway through the museum maybe, when I was like, this is not what I thought it was going to be. And it was really interesting. But when we got to the section about the kids, it blew my mind. I ended up being at the museum after the students were done. I was still at the museum for like another hour talking to the staff. I went to the internet and Googled, do I have rights not to drug my child? And CCHR popped up. I called in the morning and I got the receptionist and they put me over to the legal department right away. As soon as I got a hold of the legal department, they told me I don't have to drug my child because it's against federal law. I just started looking for any human rights organization or any law that I could pull out of my hat and take to court and say, 
you're violating my child's you know rights as a human being and I found CCHR I emailed CCHR and someone got back to me very quickly he responded and I was like no way <laughs> I was stoked <laughs> a friend passed on a video from CCHR it was meant to be that I saw that video and it really changed how I felt. I reached out to CCHR. As an instructor uh, that taught medical assisting and medical billing and coding, I had brought my students here to CCHR, so I was already familiar with the services that the organization provided. Having CCHR's website and all the information there was a, a just an incredible resource for me. I walked into my doctor's appointments armed. I had better knowledge of this DSM manual and um, basically called her out on it. You know, I said, so what test did you give my son to determine his ADHD? And she said, oh, well, you know, uh, oh, uh, well, well, uh, <laughs> we observed him. Uh, well, um, you know, she stumbled over her words. She really didn't have anything. I wanted to see proof. Show me something. She had nothing. Having so many people that I could reach out to and give me advice to deal with the situation made a humongous change in his education. I almost lost my son in, in a matter of six days. I almost lost my son. And immediately, the first, second day, I was already losing him. I was losing him that fast to the drugs. Through coming through CCHR, I saw the dangers. I got to read the literature. I got to see the videos. I got to experience it firsthand. And it's ugly. It's very ugly. But it's an ugly truth that we need to face. CCHR is definitely not trying to make anybody feel like they did anything wrong for their children or their family. You know, they're here to support you. They're here to help you seek out the correct information and weed through what is fact and what isn't fact. Every person that I've met with CCHR is going so far above and beyond Anything I needed, it was there. If I had a question, I could call. Being off the medication has changed my son's life. It's changed my life. I'm so adamant now that this is not gonna happen to my other two younger children. It's not gonna happen to anybody's child if I know about it. If you don't know the law, you, you think, wow, I'm gonna have to drug my child if you wanna keep your child with you, if you wanna keep him home. The services that they offer are superb and you need to arm yourself with the information because your children's lives may depend on it one day. CCHR just started feeding me all kinds of information and kind of just held my hand while I walked through this um, ugly litigation. I went and I hired more attorneys and I had them appeal my case and I won it. I had like all this arsenal. <laughs> Once we got the information, we vowed, we made a commitment, no more. Together, we went to the bathroom, to the toilet, opened them all up, threw them in, and we flushed them down. We said, bye, never again. We're done. I didn't know about the federal law until I spoke with CCHR. And I was going to be able to keep my son without drugging him. That was probably the best day of my life. Having CCHR behind me was huge. It pretty much saved my child's life. It's like no other organization I've ever seen in my life, ever. I'm so, so grateful to CCHR, I'm so grateful. I just felt free, finally free. It just made me stronger, it made me realize that I could do so much more than I thought I could do. I don't feel alone, I feel empowered. There's people like me out there. As long as I possibly can, I will spread the word about CCHR. If it's the last words out of my mouth before I go to the grave, I will spread the word.
Hi. I'm glad to be able to speak with you on this 15th anniversary of Parental Alienation Awareness Day and the 10th anniversary of Bubbles of Love Day. I'm Robert Samri, and along with a brilliant woman by the name of Sarvi Emo, Emo, until a few years ago, we ran the Parental Alienation Awareness Organization. One of our major accomplishments was to found this day, April 25th, uh, as a day of gathering and advocating for children of abuse through alienation. Um, this was an idea that Sarvi nurtured and promoted tirelessly. Her creativity and technical skills on social media and web design uh, were amazing and, and invaluable to this project. Uh, it's blossomed into a self-sustaining and global movement. Um, and with your permission, I want to tell you about my contribution to this amazing project. My greatest contribution was to stay out of Sarvi's way. Uh, I was a quick study and uh, I actually, I eventually got used to saying, okay, Sarvi, I'll get it on it right away. That's my part of the accomplishment. She did absolutely everything on this and deserves kudos all around. Uh, and the reason that you're gathering today on April 25th is entirely attributable to her. Um, PAAD, Parental Alienation Awareness Day, is just one example of how advocacy in social or political policy making can be not only supportive to a cause, uh, but actually essential. Um, others today, I'm sure, will tell you about the finer details and uh, the, uh, the, the, the horrors of alienation. I want to spend a bit of time understanding with you the importance of how change happens. Um, being right isn't enough. Uh, of course, being right is helpful. When you make noise, it's very helpful. But as you're probably already know, as you're probably already aware, um, even being right doesn't get you very far if the noise you're making is only heard by the wrong people or, more probably, drowned out by louder noise. Um, of all the remedies to combat alienation, one of the best is equal shared parenting. So as the chairperson of the Canadian Association for Equality and the chair of its public policy committee, last year I organized a campaign to change the proposed Canadian Federal Family Law Act. We intended to include, or have included, uh, a presumptive and rebuttable equal shared parenting clause. Uh, equal shared parenting, as I said, is a major tool for combating alienation uh, for a ton of reasons that I'm not going to get into right now because this is just about advocacy. But I built the coalition uh, out of Canadian groups and advocates and there were about 10 of us who each presented to the Justice and Human Rights Committee of the House of Commons who were passing this new legislation. Um, we actually made fantastic arguments. There were some brilliant people on that group, uh, many who have worked on equal shared parenting for a decade and longer, who know this issue inside out and backwards, uh, understand why it's important for family law and what leaving it out would mean to family law as well. So there were fantastic arguments. Um, we were always treated with dignity and respect by, by the committee, as well as the members of parliament uh, where we lobbied while we were in Ottawa. But every single one of the other people presenting were not only opposed to equal shared parenting, but saw it as their number one duty to attack and defeat. Each and every one of the other groups in front of the committee spoke about the dangers of equal shared parenting, particularly in situation where there was not only domestic violence, but even the fear of it or the claim of it, or even the most remote possibility of finding it. We were just basically drowned out. 
So everybody, I think, agrees that equal shared parenting is inappropriate in situations where power and control are being exerted by one party over another. Um, trust me, that had been taken into account. All of the arguments were made and we had it down pat, but we got drowned out. All of the other voices were louder, stronger, uh, not necessarily more credible, but had more years of experience with the groups that we were trying to fight against. So all of that, essentially, I've been talking to you about, not because we were unsuccessful, but because it's part of a process. You know, um, sometimes you can get something accomplished very quickly, but most of the time on broad things like public policy, social advocacy, that sort of thing, it takes a fair amount of time. There are a few exceptions in the recent past that have gone very quickly, but it takes a lot of time. Uh, one little drip at a time, one drip, one drip, one drip, and eventually you get a pool and the pool is successful at accomplishing whatever it was that you started off dealing with. So I, I want to be encouraging though. And I want to tell you that progress has been made. I can tell you with uh, absolute assurance that 10 or 15 years ago, people were denying that parental alienation even existed. And those were people who were given a great deal of credit. Uh, arguments were made, uh, laws were not inclusive, um, and, and the vast majority of people who dealt with family court issues just said alienation, either I don't know what it is, which was dumbfounding to, to us, or yeah, I know what it is, but it's just, you know, these men's rights guys that are going around and, and trying to continue to abuse uh, their ex-wives. And so it's nothing. It's crap. Well, that's not the case anymore. Um, there are still some people that are holding on to those arguments, but very few. We've been successful in having the courts understand not only that alienation exists, but that it's harmful, that it's abusive, and that it needs to be corrected at the earliest stages. So, uh, you know, that, that came about through also a lot of hard work and coalition building. So the basic idea that I want to leave you with is that just as we built that coalition to deal with the family law reform, uh, that coalition is still around and it will still continue to do work. It's important for you to become involved as part of a coalition, as part of any number of groups that are out there, or start your own and start advocating. Be out there. I'm going to tell you a couple of things. It will be successful eventually. You have to be, <coughs> excuse me, you have to be tenacious. You have to be prepared to hang on. Uh, but you will be successful. There are a lot of people on this call today who have been around for a long time. Join up with them. Be part of the group that makes change. Uh, it will not only help the issue that you're fighting so strongly for, it will help you personally. Getting involved, finding out what you would never have found out before. You didn't think that some of these things we're even around and you will get to know them very well. It will help you personally in your circumstances. I assume that many of you are parents. Others may be professionals and uh, wanting just to upgrade themselves a little bit, which is fantastic. But advocacy can be self-advocacy and it will give you self-awareness and, and, and dignity that you didn't have before. I remember picking up calls on a regular basis from parents who were being alienated from their kids. And although the Parental Alienation Awareness Organization was a child-focused organization, we were more concerned about the harm coming to children than the harm coming to parents. We would take the calls from the parents and regularly I would get calls and say, you know, I wanna do something. And I would direct them in the right place to do something. Uh, and they would call back and say, thank you. That was really personally helpful. It helped me understand the circumstances, but it, it validated the things that I was doing that I had concerns about. I thought I was alone and now I know I'm not, all of those sorts of things. But I also got the other calls, the other calls that haunt me to this very day 
of people that were by themselves, that didn't have groups, that left messages, and in the tone of the message that they left, not in the words, simply in the tone of the message that they left, there was this hollowness, this complete lack of hope. You know, I need help. Is there anybody that can help me? With no enthusiasm, no affect, except complete dullness. And those are the kind of calls that, that, that still haunted me. And I know those individuals would benefit a great deal for themselves, as well as the issue, if they became involved. So, again, please get involved. I'm not here to tell you who to get involved with, but there are lots of people on this call who are tremendous advocates, who have done this for a while and would love your help, and you should love to help them. Thank you for listening. I wish you all the best. Uh, for those of you who have kids that are caught into this thing, I hope for them to be rescued very quickly, uh, and I hope that you're part of that help. So have a great Parental Alienation Awareness Day. Come out of this stronger. Look to each other for support. Give that support to someone who's doing good work. All the best. Hi, my name is Frances Bradshaw, Senior Advisor to the Mayor of Brampton. On April 25th, we ask you to join us by wearing royal blue and fighting against parental alienation, a serious form of child abuse. It affects countless families in our community and around the world. It has no religion, it has no gender, it has no race, it has no socioeconomic status. It affects those rich and poor, young and old alike. It affects parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and step-parents. And most tragically, it affects children. Visit the link below to get more information or for resources and support. And again, on April 25th, wear royal blue with us and join our digital campaign. Thank you. And remember, you're not alone. Good day, everybody. I'm Gene C. Coleman. I am going to speak for a few minutes on solutions to parental alienation. I am recording uh, this presentation on Friday, April 24th. Parental alienation research has developed substantially over recent years. The chart that you see on the PowerPoint has been adapted from the work of Kelly and Johnston in 2001 by Professor Nick Bala and Dr. Barbara Fiddler. And it most, uh, this chart most recently appears in their current paper that is being published this month. Uh, it might be up already, or if not, in the next few days. It's in the Family Court Review uh, on parental alienation. In fact, that is a special issue of the Family Court Review with a number of distinguished authors presenting their latest research and their various points of view. Please note that this above uh, diagram uh, or chart demonstrates that there are a multitude of factors that can influence a child's response to parental conflict, conflict and reinforce parental alienation or PCCP behaviors. What's that, you ask? I'm glad you asked. Parent-child contact problems, a less volatile term than parental alienation, so researchers are, and commentators are tending more now to use that term, parent-child contact problems. By focusing on the multidimensional factors, we are able to focus more on solutions, and that's what I wanted to talk about today, solutions. We're able to focus more on solutions and less on blame. Perhaps such an approach might serve to encourage the alienator to cooperate, to find solutions to PCCP, parent-child contact problems. And before I proceed, I should say something now that I should have said already. I want to thank the Equal Parenting for Children organization for inviting me to address you here 
today. Lawyers and judges who take a restorative, solution oriented approach to resolving PCCP issues in conjunction with other professionals may be able to promote, albeit with the specter of coercive uh, nature of the court system, they may be able to promote restoration of parent-child relationships, and that's really what we need to accomplish. Modern research has focused more on behaviors, on parental alienating behaviors, or PABs, P-A-B-S. I have always held to the view that lawyers and others ought to label the behaviors as opposed to striving to fix a parent with the pejorative label parental alienator. Many parents engage in PABs to some greater or lesser extent. They do so for a variety, for a variety of reasons. Many uh, are conscious, some are quite conscious, and, and some are simply not. When those paths reach such a level, the child has no effective choice but to totally reject one parent, that's when we are dealing with what we colloquially describe as parental alienation. So my advice to lawyers and litigants is don't try to prove parental alienation. Rather, do describe the behaviors and do give constructive suggestions for solutions. Professor Warshak in his 2020 paper, also coming out in the April edition of the Family Court Review, talks about children's behaviors and he distinguishes the negative type behaviors that children uh, who are alienated engage in from behavior that does not indicate parental alienation. I'm sure from other speakers you're going to hear what those behaviors are, so I won't go into them now. And so Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Warshak points out a number of uh, factors uh, that are, or characteristics, phenomenon, seven of them to be exact. The first is the behavior has to be chronic rather than temporary and short-lived but can include an ongoing pattern of intermittent alienation that recedes in the presence of the rejected parent, but returns when in the presence of the favored parent. In order to classify something as parental alienation in Dr. Warshak's view, the behavior has to be frequent as opposed to simply occasional. Thirdly, it has to be per pervasive. The behavior occurs in most situations rather than only in certain situations. Fourthly, the behavior occurs without displays of genuine love and affection towards the rejected parent. The behavior, uh, fifth of all, is directed at only one parent. Sixthly, the behavior does not reflect typical dynamics for that child's stage of development. And finally, the behavior is disproportionate to and not justified by the rejected parent's past or current behavior. So my caution here, as Dr. Warshak's caution, is not every sort of negative behavior by a child to the parent is, oh, parental alienation, parental alienation. No, it has to, according to Dr. Warshak, and of course I, I, I hold by what Dr. Warshak says, I follow him, is that we have to have these seven, uh, most, all if not most of, um, of these characteristics. I want to share with you a quote from a uh, Westlaw uh, platform that has a number of resources for lawyers. And there's a, there's a very good memo there on that, um, on that platform from the uh, McDonald and Partners law firm, a paper they present, uh, put on, the, on that platform. Parental, parental alienation constitutes severe emotional abuse of children, putting them at risk of serious mental harm, the clinical literature and academic research have matured 
so that one can firmly conclude that deliberate alienation of children from a parent is emotional abuse of such a magnitude that it can invoke child protection statutes and must be dealt with forcefully and immediately. That's a great quote. I, and you'll see on the screen, it says cases cited. They have a number of cases cited that support that provision. So while they seem to hold by, uh, seem to agree with, but of course, what they're writing, they have cases upon which to rely. Now that leads us to solutions. And just like that quote I just gave you, talked about act immediately, uh, uh, Dr. Fiddler, Professor Bala, Dr. Saini in their 2013 paper state, responding to parent-child contact issues at an early stage may prevent them from becoming severe and entrenched. Respond early uh, is a thing. Education programs for parents are out there, including internet-based programs. One can also, in situations of PA, have a child custody access assessment, unfortunately, tend to take too long. They're not binding on the court, only persuasive, and they do cost a lot of money. A parental coordinator is a, uh, a method used in high-conflict cases. The parental coordinator is appointed by agreement of the parties, often reinforced with a court order to that effect. The parental coordinator's task is to hear the parties when they've got something to say. Uh, there has to first be a, a, an agreement with respect to custody access, even interim, or, or there has to be an order with respect to custody access. Then you can appoint a coordinator following all the proper legal procedures, and the parental coordinator first tries to bring the parents to their own solution. If that doesn't work, and here's where this is so effective, the parental coordinator can um, make a binding decision called an arbitral award. So I like a uh, parental coordinator. It can bring definite action to situation where parents are at loggerheads. Other experts, um, Generally speaking, any other experts must be jointly retained in the province of Ontario. Ontario Regulation 250-19, in effect as of 1st of September 2019, modified Rule 20, Rule 20.2, and in particular Sub 8, says the custody and access matters must have a joint expert unless the court orders otherwise. And note Rule 20.2 Sub 15, reuse of experts' reports at motions. I won't get into detail here, just if you want to have an expert report at a motion, look at that rule that I just cited. However, the procedures for Office of the Children's Lawyer and Custody Access Assessments under the Children's Law Reform Act, Parental Capacity Assessments under the Child Youth and Family Services Act, they continue to have their own statutory and regulatory provisions. Rule 20.3 sub 9 is the authority for that. The use of mental health experts, um, we have to take note of. There are many types of therapy that might be, uh, that might be helpful. Uh, there's this situation of the rejected parent and child coming together with therapy, both parents together for therapy, or individually, and or individually, and you have can of course have the child along. Where a child is not participating in access visits with a parent due to parental alienation or control or manipulation, treatment will be sought by the child. At least the one case was not ordered to attend access visits. Uh, and, uh, my authority for that is a case called Kelly versus Metcalf. Where children have been alienated from a parent, counseling will be ordered with the goal of reestablishing a relationship. And that's according to the case up on the screen there, PowerPoint de la Sable de Longuerre and Castagne, 2012 case in the Terra Superior Court of Justice. 
therapeutic reconciliation or reunification, reunification therapy. The court may order a child to attend reunification therapy to prevent future harm as well as to resolve current issues. Case is Carwell. And here's another case, reunification therapy is ordered in McClintock versus Karam. And reunification uh, therapy is also used as an adjunct where primary residence is changed. Increasing uh, parenting time is also a, a solution that we have. We do that to allow the child to experience more time with the target or alienated parent. So that child will come to realize that this parent really isn't that bad hopefully. It's also important to have one judge in PA cases manage the case from start to almost finish. If there's a trial, then of course you have to have a different uh, judge because that first judge may have heard offers to settle. Uh, contempt of court orders, it's uh, sort of the, uh, the nuclear bomb of family law, but if you have to use it, by all means. Financial, there can be financial pennies, uh, penalties levied as an adjunct to contempt or on their own. And of course, legal fees, as we call it in Ontario, costs uh, as another remedy to let a parent know that they're not behaving properly. Bill Eddy is the co-founder of the High Conflict Institute and the author of Don't Alienate the Kids. He tells us as follows, treatment of alienation requires a family systems approach. Remember that chart from earlier? Same sort of point here, family system approach. With family counseling for both parents and the children to teach and reinforce flexible thinking, managed, managed, managed emotions, moderate behavior, and checking oneself rather than blaming others. Remember my quote earlier about blaming others? Child counseling alone or reunification counseling just between the rejected parent and child consistently fails because the family system remains unchanged. That's the end of the quote. Sorry for my interjections. I couldn't resist. Now, what I just quoted from is a, a very short paper that uh, Bill Eddy posted called 10 Things to Understand About Alienation, Resistance or Refusal to See a Parent. It's from the Association of Family and Conciliation Courts newsletter that I received, I think, two or three days ago. Uh, and for my PowerPoint here, I gave a longer presentation last night, sponsored by my firm and Equal uh, Parenting for Children and other organizations. And that PowerPoint uh, will be up hopefully later today at my website, complexfamilylaw.com. Uh, but if it don't, succeed in getting it up there uh, today, hopefully uh, early next week, and you can have all the sites and, and, and sources uh, that I'm referring to today and more that I referred to in my talk yesterday evening. I divide the solutions up to minimum level solutions or maximum level solutions. I'm going to talk about what I call the maximum level solutions specific court orders. You want your court order to be detailed, unambiguous. As I indicated earlier, you want judges to retain jurisdiction over a file. Don't let it go to 10 different judges. Police enforcement, we don't like the police coming in the presence of the children, but sometimes there's no choice. Reversing primary residence, of course, is, the, is uh, one of the most drastic uh, remedies, but it's done. It is done. Uh, when combined with such programs as the Family Bridges Program, it uh, tends to work very well. We had Dr. Warshak as a uh, special surprise guest at, the, um, at my webinar last night, and he reported on the research that was done on the Family Bridges Program showing a very high degree of success. Not in every case, but in many. Um, a quote from Faber versus Gallicano, Ontario Superior Court of Justice, 2012, where extreme irrational and paranoid behavior by one parent adversely affects the needs and well-being of the children uh, exists. A change in custody will be ordered to the parent who is able to include the other parent in the lives of the children. 
you know, we have the maximum contact principle in uh, Canadian and in Ontario law. And uh, the application of that principle in terms of switching residence where it has to be done is an example in Faber versus Gallicano. Similarly, in L versus S, a 2008 Superior Court of Justice case in Ontario as well. Alienation can result in change of residence. And another case as well with a 12-year-old, a case of PA versus C. More cases there, ST versus JT, that's the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal. What I did was when I was preparing for my, for my talk yesterday, which I'm sharing part of it here with you, uh, with you distinguished people today, as I searched, I did a search on parental alienation in Westlaw, and then I narrowed it down to Court of Appeal decisions. So I wanted to make sure I had the most recent Court of Appeal decisions that were relevant to solutions uh, for parental alienation. But these were the two main uh, cases that came up, AF versus CH, Ontario Court of Appeal, from 14th of August, uh, just passed. This is a 14-year-old switch custody. And we often hear, ah, oh, the courts won't touch it if the kid is 12, 13, 14. Not true. 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds. Yes, in the appropriate case. And where we have to um, suspend contact, with the alienator parent, and we often do because we have to remove the toxicity out of the mix, then we do that. When I say we, I mean courts. Uh, and then the alienator might have to have supervised access to make sure that the alienator does not say horrid things to the child. Uh, two uh, companies that operate in Ontario, Braden Supervision Services and Side-by-Side -side Supervised Access Services are good in this area. Again, Bill Eddy, I'd like to quote from him. In severe cases, consideration should be given by the court to temporarily suspend contact with the favored parent when interventions with the goal of reconnecting a child and rejected parent have been undermined by the favored parent. Intensive weekend programs or camps for the child with the rejected parent have been found to show promise in reuniting them. And one of the programs that I'm sure Mr. Eddy had in mind when he wrote this was the Family Bridges program to which I have already referred. As I mentioned, the, uh, my full presentation, my full PowerPoint presentation will be um, up on my website shortly. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Equal Parenting for children for inviting me here to uh, speak today. And uh, those of you who are um, experiencing parental alienation, I presume if you're on this webinar, you are the target parent or the alienated parent. My heart goes out to all of you. And I hope that the things that you learn in this, uh, not just my presentation, but all the others will, will, um, will assist you. If you have not yet read Divorce Poison by Dr. Richard Warshak, there. If you've not read yet, yet read Divorce Poison by Dr. Richard Warshak, then I strongly encourage you to do so. Of course, you can get it online from Amazon or wherever. And this is an excellent book. I recommend it to all of my clients that are experiencing parental alienation. He has real life examples uh, in his book. It is this a useful book for lawyers to read, social workers, psychologists, and also highly useful for people that are suffering from parental alienation. If you're at this conference, chances are you've already heard about this book, already been recommended to you. But as I said, if you're a newbie, please do yourself a favor and buy Dr. Warshak's book. I do not get a commission on the sales. Please, it will do you, it will do you very good. So I thank you. Um, I thank you all for, uh, for listening. And if I can just uh, stop this recording, yes, and uh, have a very enjoyable rest of the day. And everybody, please stay safe out there, stay healthy, stay at home. Hi, my name is Michael Jovi. I'm the executive director of the Boys and Girls Club Appeal. 
The Boys and Girls Club of Peel believes in the preservation and dignity of the family unit. We believe it's because of our families we are the people we grow up to be. And we know that this is not always for the better. This is why on Saturday, April 25th, we invite you to join us as we partner with our local community, Put Kids First, a parental alienation group here in Brampton, Ontario, as we acknowledge the negative impacts physically and mentally that parental alienation has on our children, youth and families across the world and right here in our own communities. Together through education, awareness and being a living example, we can begin to change the narrative regarding domestic violence because that's what parental alienation is, domestic violence. With our partners at Put Kids First, we call on our federal and provincial governments to issue a call to action and bring the end to parental alienation, especially during these times of global crisis. Our children, youth and families deserve it. You deserve it. We all deserve it. So on April 25th, we ask you to use the hashtags uh, parental alienation awareness and end parental alienation. And together we can change the narrative and we can bring an end to domestic violence and parental alienation. April is Parental Alienation Awareness Month. Now, what is parental alienation? Well, it's the process by which a child becomes estranged from a parent by virtue of psychological manipulation towards another parent. And that's why today I'm wearing my blue in solidarity for this cause, to put those at the forefront who are most vulnerable and most important in all of this, to be a voice for the voiceless, the children. While the pandemic is in effect and we won't be able to gather at Brampton City Hall for the flag raising on April 25th, right where you are, while maintaining social distancing, you can do your part to raise awareness for the cause. Simply by wearing royal blue, posting to your social medias with the hashtag end parental alienation and child abuse, be a voice for the voiceless. I also encourage you that for your profile picture, in addition to doing your posting, that you will use the parental alienation ribbon for your profile picture to show your support. It's incumbent on all of us to end the stigma, to end the abuse, to put children first and end parental alienation once and for all. We all have a part to play in this. My name is Kimberly Shelley Ajibalade. And I stand up against parental alienation and child abuse. Hi, my name is Virginia Mathur. Unfortunately, this year there will be no flag raising for Parental Alienation Awareness Day on April 25th because of the virus. But that doesn't mean you still can't be the voice for the voiceless. So campaign with us on April 25th. Use the hashtags, hashtag end parental alienation and hashtag end child abuse. Wear your royal blue to fight against parental alienation. When one parent alienates their child from another parent and not only causes a cycle detrimental consequences but it affects that child immensely so together we can fix this so wear your royal blue and fight with us separation isolation division detachment imagine yourself knowing that you are capable of helping someone heal but you can't because you are told that you are the one destroying them. But you know that you're not. My name is Ashani Sama, and I would like to share with you something that I am passionate about bringing awareness to. Parental alienation. Parental alienation can involve a child being separated, isolated, and detached from the other parent through psychological manipulation. A child can be influenced to deny love from its other parent. The child can be taught to view its alienating parent as good and honest and its targeted parent as dishonest and unfavorable. I firmly believe that everyone's voice matters. There is sincere importance of giving voices to the voiceless, shedding light to all children being human, it doesn't matter what age you are. You can learn and advocate about child abuse because all voices of children matter. I hope to spread awareness to all those around on how we can advocate to keep children safe and loved. We need to work together to keep our community, especially children safe. It's up to us to be the change we wish to see in this world. Our purpose as humans 
is to uplift others in many ways possible, using our gifts to make the future of tomorrow a better one. I'm inviting all individuals to campaign on Saturday, April 25th by wearing royal blue. You can educate yourself about parental alienation by using hashtag end parental alienation and hashtag end child abuse. Before any adult was an adult, they were once a child too. It's time to make a difference. Children have a voice just as much as any adults do. Change, if you believe in it, will always begin with you. It's time to make a difference. Hi, I'm Monique Mason. And I am Jenna Noble, and Monique and I are, are the owners of Pathways Family Coaching. So today we want to talk about a family crisis that's actually ripping millions of parents and children apart every year. It's robbing children of their innocence, and it has long-term effects that affect both the parents and the children. So our goals for today is we're going to talk about what exactly is parental alienation. What types of tactics are parents using to alienate their children? So what things can you look for to know if this is happening in your family before it gets very serious? Um, how it displays in the child. So what types of behaviors will a child display that's being alienated from a parent? What are the long-term effects on both the parent that is being alienated and the child? Uh, the root causes of this family dynamic. We can't solve something if we don't know why this is happening. And why is there so much controversy surrounding this term parental alienation? And what needs to change to protect these families? So what exactly is parental alienation? Well, it's when a family member influences and weaponizes a child against one parent. And it typically results in the suppression of the child's attachment and leads to the child actually rejecting and emotionally cutting off from a parent for frivolous reasons. One thing we like to mention here is that it can be any family member. Typically that member is a, is a spouse or an ex-spouse, but it also can be you know, the parents, parents, so the grandparents, aunts, uncles, anyone in the family. So as Monique had stated earlier, um, alienation results in the suppression of the attachment system or the attachment between the parent and the child. So what really is attachment? So attachment is a deep and enduring emotional bond that connects one person to another across time and space. So when you think of attachment between a parent and child, you can think about that, that very deep, close, loving, um, natural, strong bond that they have to each other. So Dr. Amy Baker has actually done a tremendous amount of research um, with adults who were once alienated as children. And she's actually come up with a list of 17 different strategies or tactics that parents use to actually alienate their children from the other parent. Now here, we don't list all 17, but we list the big ones. Um, the first is being bad mouthing. So, you know, the parent may call their ex-spouse names. Um, the other is limiting contact. Now limiting contact can be, you know, not complying with court orders or, you know, consistently being late for, for exchanges. They interfere with communication a lot. They give the child the impression that the rejected parent is unsafe or unavailable. They quite often share inappropriate information, so it's common for these parents to actually talk about court proceedings, child support, custody, all that kind of thing. They often ask the child to spy or keep secrets on the other parent. Sometimes they even develop hand signals, you know, as a form of communication during parenting exchanges. They quite often withhold information 
Um, this can include, you know, leaving the other parents' information off of registration forms for school and extracurricular activities and things like that. They often refer to the rejected parent by first name. Um, another common thing that they do is, you know, encourage the child to call the step parent mom or dad. It is also common for them to change a child's name. Now, sometimes they change the name legally, but also just even assigning a new, you know, nickname for the child. And lastly, but not least, they cultivate dependency. So they'll encourage the child to call them when they're at the other parent's house if there's a problem. So signs of parental alienation. So now we're going to talk about the, the child's behavior. So what kind of things to look for in your children if you suspect this is happening? Um, so first off, these, these um, signs were coined by Dr. Richard Gardner. So I would recommend anyone that's just hearing about alienation to take a look at his work. Um, he's well respected. And we're going to talk later on about, you know, a bit of controversy surrounding that as well. So first off is a campaign of denigration. So Monique, do you mind touching on that a little bit? Sure. So by campaign of denigration, this is kind of the opposite of bad mouthing, right? It's when the child actually starts engaging in the bad mouthing with the parent. Thank you. So also frivolous reasons for the denigration, right? So often um, the, the alienating parent will take something very small. Um, you know, I've even heard kids, their reason for running their parent down or, or rejecting them was, well, they sweep funny. I hate the way they sweep the floor, right? So it's very frivolous, meaningless uh, reasons that they will find and magnify and turn into something that is worthy of denigrating the parent. Um, also, lack of ambivalence. Monique, do you mind? Sure. Um, so ambivalence really means that a child can view a parent as having both good and bad qualities. Now, this lack of ambival ambivalence really means that the parent, pardon me, the, the child actually views a parent as having only bad qualities, and the other parent is only having good qualities. Exactly. Thank you. Also, the independent thinker, uh, they refer to this as the independent thinker phenomenon. So what happens is the child will often parrot the words and the desires and feelings of their alienating parent. Um, they will make decisions that they claim are completely independent of their parent. But like I said, it will be very parroting and mirror the desires of the alienating parent. Uh, but the child really does truly feel that they are completely independent and their thoughts and feelings are their own. So, for example, um, you know, they may say that, you know, my parent, my, my alienating parent, they would never call it an alienating parent, but my parent, you know, has never told me that I can't see you. I don't want to see you. This is my decision but they're being influenced to make that choice by their alienating parent. So also a big one is the absence of guilt. So Monique, can you touch on that for me? Sure. Uh, with regards to the absence of guilt, like quite often these children will treat their disfavored parent really mean and really disrespectfully, but at the same time, they don't feel guilty for it. So it doesn't, there's, there's no internal gauge that, that makes them feel bad so that they actually behave in a more appropriate way. Right, thank you. And I'd just like to elaborate a bit. I do believe that alienated children do suffer from an extreme guilt, um, but they definitely do not show this when it comes to their um, disfavored parent. Uh, like Monique said, they're, they're, they can be very hateful, they can be very mean and rejecting, um, and they do it with quite a cold callus, where uh, you know a child in a usual relationship with a parent would not you know, have the ability to do so. They would feel very guilty about their, their actions. So reflexive support for the favored parent. So in this dynamic, the, the alienating parent really conditions the child to fight their battles and to, um, you know, almost reactively uh, stand up for them no matter what is happening. The, the parent is always in the right, um, no matter, you know, if they were perhaps in the wrong in that moment, the child will with um, you know, extreme anger sometimes and um, you know, a fighting type spirit will always, always reflexively support that parent in whatever they are doing. Also rejection of extended family. 
So do you want to talk about that, Monique? Sure. Um, now, quite often, when the child emotionally cuts off from the parent, they'll emotionally cut off from anybody who supports that parent. This can include grandparents, aunts, uncles, um, even their own siblings. Yeah, you're right. And this can get really complicated too, because um, I think people, when they start to learn about alienation, or those in the world that may know a tiny bit about it, about it and see the dynamic perhaps going on, they don't understand that the extended family is not always rejected. So if the extended family of the disfavored parent is seeming to side with that disfavored parent or support their family member, then the children will cut them off. But it is often that the extended family of the disfavored or alienated parent will actually become triangulated with the alienating parent. And if the children view that that parent's family is supportive of their alienating parent, their favored parent, they will hold a relationship with them, but not their alienated parent. Did that make, mis make sense, Monique? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, <I> did. <laughs> <laughs> Felt like I was talking in circles. Um, also the presence of borrowed scenarios. So, um, you know, there are a lot of, weaponizing of truce and alienation. Um, it can be a very small truth that's twisted and distorted and blown up. Um, and a lot of lies can just be brought into the situation about scenarios that occurred. So what happens often is that the, the alienating parent will be telling the child these things that perhaps, you know, um, for example, you know, your father cheated on me. That may not be the truth. That might have been a lie. And the child will then take that on as their own um, true scenario. Right? So they start to borrow the stories of their favored parent as truth. Um, and then that becomes a reason to reject their parent. Yeah. And also just to expand on that a little bit, um, they quite often start parroting their words. Yes, very much. But, so. you know, stop trying to buy my love, you know, that kind of thing. Correct. Yeah. I actually just was working with a client yesterday and this is very, very common where parents will say, and I did it too, you know, I'm pretty sure these emails are coming from my ex, not from my children. It sounds like my ex, so I'm pretty sure it's, it's him or her, it's not my kids. Um, and I had to tell my client yesterday, you know, it most likely is your children because the children do start to talk very similarly to their alienating parent and they use the exact same language as Monique already, had already stated. So now we just want to look at what the long-term effects of the suppressed attachment system in the child are. Um, now, these effects actually affect the child for the rest of their lives, even after reconnection with an alienated parent as an adult. So anxiety and depression are common. Self-hatred, because for most of their lives, they've hated one parent or another or, you know, been told terrible things about that parent. So what they really do is they interpret that as, you know, well, that parent is half of me and that parent's not, that parent is bad. So that makes me half bad. Um, they display a tremendous lack of trust and this leads to difficulty forming relationships throughout the rest of their lives. Uh, substance abuse, whether it be alcohol, illegal drugs, you know, sexual promise, promiscuity, uh, personality disorders. You know, a lot of these kids can develop, you know, personality disorders as adults. And last but not least is suicide. Yeah, so as you can see, the, the long-term effects on these children is, um, you know, it's it, they're life altering. And even like Monique said, even with the uh, repair of the relationship with, between the child and the alienated parent. I mean, these effects can go on and on and, you know, lack of trust, just to go back to that one, the children, the child or children feel like they're being lied to their whole lives because they have a parent that's saying, no, I love you. I love you. I love you. And they have another parent saying that parent doesn't love you, right? They, they abandoned you. They don't want anything to do with you or, you know, they're, they're mean, they're scary. They, they used to beat me. So they either fear them or drive that hatred home. Um, and if that child then in their adult years finds out that 
you know, those were lies and my, my alienated parent is actually a good person and I missed out on that relationship, then, you know, then they realize that their other parent lied to them their whole life too. So it's really a lose-lose for these kids. So not only is there effects on the children, the, the parent that is being alienated, the, the effects are, um, you know, they're, they're extreme. So most of these parents are dealing with severe depression um, because they're being abused and they're, you know, watching their children being whipped, ripped away from them. And not only are they losing them physically, but it's almost like they're, they're losing them psychologically because the child's whole personality changes and, you know, they become unrecognizable to the parents. So depression is, is um, you know, very, very common. Isolation. So one of the tactics these parents use is that they, they isolate their other parent right? They triangulate friends, family, they triangulate the children. They want this parent to be left with no one. Um, and then to further that, because the parent is feeling, you know, a great deal of guilt and shame and they're depressed, they often self-isolate as well because those around them don't understand what they're going through. Um, Monique, I know you can, um, you know, agree to this, that when you do try to talk to people about what you're experiencing, that you're losing your children, uh, most people look at you like you're crazy and say, well, you know, that makes no sense. Some, there has to be more to the story. So it's really hard because you, it's, it's hard to find support, people that understand. And that goes into feeling helplessness, right? No one can really help you, it feels like. Um, you know, it feels like your children are drowning and people are just watching and nobody's throwing a life preserver as you scream. So there's a massive feeling of helplessness um, which leads to CPTSD. So complex PTSD is different than PTSD. I'm not going to go into it, but I encourage you to look it up, um, which is a reason that the alienated parent is left very destabilized, and often they end up looking like the crazy one, right? We, we look like the crazy people because we are dealing with CPTSD. Our emotions are out of control. Uh, we don't know how to regulate ourselves. Um, you know, we're dealing with depression and we're, we're begging for help. And then the financial burden. So unfortunately, we have to rely on the, the court system, the justice system to help us. And it is just not set up for this situation. It actually re-abuses parents that are already dealing with this form of abuse. And it's a very heavy financial burden to navigate. Um, on top of the, the financial burden of the court system, often we have to hire mental health therapists to get involved, which come at a heavy price tag as well. Um, you know, different custody evaluations, um, you know, different reports that we need to hire specialists to get involved in. So many times these parents are left, um, you know, completely um, financially strapped. They've lost everything. And again, because of all these things above, there was a very high percentage of parents that do take their life because they cannot take the financial stress, the emotional stress, the abuse, the depression, the isolation, the helplessness. They just feel completely um, like there's nowhere to turn and they unfortunately take their lives. Yeah, and I just wanna expand on something you said. You had mentioned sure. the word abuse. And I think something that we have to really start recognizing is that parental alienation is really a form of intimate partner violence, you know, yes. against, against the ex-spouse and really psychological abuse against a child. So absolutely. I think that's important to understand. Yes, absolutely. So a few important notes that we want to bring up is that, you know, just because a child is rejecting a parent does not necessarily mean that they're being alienated. There are children who legitimately reject a parent who is abusing them. Um, moms or dads can be alienating parents. And as mentioned previously, also grandparents, aunts and uncles can also be alienating. Mm -hmm. Something that people don't realize is that kids can be alienated within intact families. So separation and divorce does not necessarily have to come into play in order for a child to be alienated from a parent. And also, not every child actually succumbs to the pressure of alienation. This really depends on 
you know, how resilient the child is and what kind of skills of resilience are taught. Correct. Yeah, and also for the last one there um, about the child succumbing, it, it's really up to the left behind, disfavored, alienated, alienated excuse me, parent um, to learn skills to help their children to navigate this because, you know, kills kids, excuse me, look to their parents for, um, you know, tools and resources. So it, it is a possibility to help your child navigate this and not get pulled right into the alienation. So why is this happening? This is one of the questions that every alienated parent goes through. Why is this happening to me, right? We're confused, we're lost, we, we just don't understand what, what is going on here. So there's a few things. Personality disorders drive alienation. So that does not necessarily mean that the alienated parent has to have a diagnosed or diagnosable personality disorder but they will definitely show strong traits of personality disorders, either narcissism or borderline personality disorder are the most common. And there are four catalysts of a high conflict personality. So first there's a pattern of blaming others, right? A healthy person, um, you know, they have a drive for accountability, right? Where these types of personalities have zero accountability and someone else is always at fault. And at, in this case, it is the other parent. They have very all or nothing thinking. So you can even think of this as something called psychological splitting, very black and white thinking. There is no gray area. Um, unmanaged or intense emotions. So another hallmark of personality disorder, right? These people are not able to regulate themselves. Um, and they, they often will, you know, have rages in the home and um, just be completely out of control. And very extreme behaviors. Monique, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think, I think just the, the intense emotions is what leads to the extreme behaviors, you know, because if they're yeah. not regulated emotionally, they tend to, whether it's, it could be, it can turn to physical abuse, mm -hmm. it can turn to like raging, you know, just yeah. uncontrolled, unmanaged behaviors. Yeah, and another thing about the emotions that just popped into my head is that um, most of us use a, a mix of, you know, rationale and um, emotion to guide us, right? But we try to let our, our brains do the leading. Whereas those that have really unchecked or unmanaged intense emotions, their emotions are kind of their reality. Right, so they're making decisions based on feelings instead of the rational of what's happening around them. So, for example, um, you know, a spouse may feel like their partner's cheating on them. They may feel that way, but that's not the reality, right? Rationally, they're like, okay, that's not true. I was, you know, off in left field about that. But when you're dealing with someone like this, when they feel like their spouse is cheating on them, that spouse is cheating on them. It is, it is signed and, and is sealed, and that is their reality. So as Jenna mentioned, you know, um, there are two common personality disorders or personality disorder traits that kind of show up in parents who alienate their children. Um, the first is narcissistic personality disorder or NPD. And I think most people, um, are familiar with, you know, those people who think that, you know, they're the best things since sliced bread, they're, you know, they've got this grandiose sense of self, like they're more important than everyone. And they tend to fantasize, you know, a lot about, you know, how important they are and how much everybody loves them. They always believe that they're better than everybody else. And, and because of that, they develop this sense of entitlement and they just take what they think, you know, that they deserve. And in doing this, they actually, they have a chronic um, lack of respect for boundaries. So they quite often will cross people's boundaries, other people's boundaries, or even, you know, not have any boundaries themselves. They exploit others they have a tremendous lack of empathy and are very arrogant. 
And, you know, the, the whole root of narcissistic personality disorder is actually um, a real, a, like a lack of sense of self and low self-esteem. Um, so this leads to a need for excessive admiration. So you'll see them cutting other people down and, you know, one-upping people all the time and, you know, looking for fishing for compliments just to kind of feed their ego. So the other personality disorder um, or traits of that usually will pop up in the alienating parent is borderline personality disorder or BPD. So to understand, these are both cluster B personalities, both MPD and BPD. So you may see lots of crossovers between the two and, and kind of, you know, it gets confusing which is which, or sometimes the person might have both or traits of both. So with BPD, uh, it includes a distorted sense of their self. So um, kind of like NPD, th these people don't have a strong sense of who they are. So they tend to fluctuate uh, you know, in their dress and their likes, um, and they, they really aren't grounded in, you know, their true authentic, um, you know, self or who they are. So they will often mirror or pick up the, the likes and the look and the, you know, different traits of those that they're around um, because, you know, again, they don't know who they are, so they're just following the lead of the other people they're incredibly impul impulsive. So they're usually horrible money managers um, because they spend every penny they get very quickly. Um, they make very impulsive decisions, even putting them in dangerous situations. So, you know, that could be with um, respect to, you know, use of drugs and drinking, um, driving recklessly, um, you know, it can be eating. They often have extreme eating disorders or binge eating issues. Um, they just make impulsive decisions on the fly and, you know, it can put them into even s sexual promiscuity, dangerous type situations as well. Um, they're highly, highly sensitive. So they're often um, thought of as, you know, they have an emotional skin that's on fire all the time. So, you know, a light breeze or a, a, a wrong word can, um, you know, feel like, the end of the world. Uh, Monique and I not long ago had a conversation with a woman that we're, you know, acquaintances with that's been in treatment for a long time for her BPD and she was very forthright and um, really helped us to understand what's going on in the mind of someone that has borderline personality disorder and she spoke of, you know, when she would spill a glass of milk or, you know, drop a donut or something, to us, we'd be like, oh, that sucks, we clean it up. But for her, she said the emotions attached to it were so extreme that it was like losing someone you love. So just to put it into perspective of how extreme those emotions can be. Um, strong emotional reaction. So I guess I was kind of speaking about that already. So their, their reactions really don't fit the scenario, just like the spilled milk. Um, and often, you know, very small factors, like maybe a friend says something, oh, you know, I don't like those pants on you. Uh, they might turn to hate. Uh, their, their reaction, again, does not fit the scenario of what's going on around them. And they may, you know, completely cut that friend out of their life for saying something like that to them. Or most of us would be like, well, I don't really care. I like my pants. <laughs> uh, so they have a lack of disrespect uh, and boundaries. So... They will disrespect your boundaries. They will step over them constantly. So if you're dealing with someone like this, you need to be very firm and have very strong guarded boundaries. Um, and they themselves don't have boundaries. So one hallmark I find with BPD is that as soon as you start talking to them, they divulge every intimate detail about themselves. Right? So usually over time, as you form a relationship, you get to know somebody better. These types of people, no boundaries. Everything about them is on the table right from the beginning. So that's a bit of a red flag. Uh, they have a pattern of unstable relationships. So, you know, looking back at the things we've already talked about, the emotional reactions, the lack of boundaries, they're very, you know, sensitive and impulsive. Uh, that just goes to speak to, you know, why their relationships are so unstable. Um, and they'll, they'll often go through partners very fast. Um, and uh, they'll go between partners very quickly. There's no, there's no leg in a relationship. 
um, they can have psychotic like symptoms in times of extreme stress. So um, in high stress scenarios, they can actually um, have, um, you know, psychotic effects such as hearing voices. Um, they can become incredibly paranoid uh, to the degree of their paranoia becomes a reality. So they're paranoid something's happening. So they really think it's happening. So it, it can almost it can almost exhibit as a bit of a mania in those high stress situations. Yeah. The only other thing I wanted to add is that, you know, sometimes the name of this disorder is a little bit um, deceiving, like borderline personality mm -hmm. dis disorder. So there, it is also known by EUPD, which is emotionally unstable personality disorder, which seems a little bit more fitting because this is really the issue they have is, is rooted in, you know, lack of regulation of their emotions. Yeah, and I just thought of a few things too, is that um, they tend to cut um, due to their impulsive nature and their um, emotional reactions and such, they tend to be cutters. Um, and they also are incredibly, incredibly high risk of suicide. So of all the personality disorders, because of the intense emotions that they're dealing with, it is very, very common for them to, to attempt to or to be successful in taking their life. Uh, and they're often misdiagnosed as bipolar, um, which is very difficult because they're being treated for bipolar and that's really not helping the, the, the personality, excuse me, personality disorder that they're, they're actually dealing with. And again, often the mistreatment will lead to these, these people taking their own lives. Something we want to point out is personality disorders really are a result of trauma and this trauma tends to kind of transgress through the generations in a family. Did you want to add to that, Jenna? Um, yeah, there's a, there's a bit of difference in opinion out there about how personalities or personality disorders are formed. It does seem to be rooted in trauma. It's also genetic. Um, but we also know now that that trauma is genetically handed down through the generations. So um, that's why we call it transgenerational trauma because they hand it down both psychologically and we actually do hand our trauma down to our, our children genetically. So this term parental alienation, there is a lot of controversy around it, um, which is actually a huge issue because it is, it is stalling the, the solution that families desperately need. So I spoke of Dr. Richard Gardner earlier when we were talking about the behaviors of the children. And Dr. Richard Gardner was originally, um, he had petitioned to have parental alienation syndrome or PAS added to the DSM in the, in the 1980s, excuse me. Um, so he had theorized that this was a new syndrome, that these children were presenting something that he had never seen before. Uh, the APA has continued to deny its inclusion in the DSM. Um, and I understand why um, parental alienation is not really a diagnosis. It's a relation, it's a relationship, relationship issue, excuse me. Um, so the APA, I would say, they, I don't think they are saying it, it doesn't exist. The problem certainly exists, but just to diagnose it as parental alienation is not possible. Um, Dr. Craig Childress, he recently came on the scene and he is offering a path to the diagnosis of child psychological abuse. So this is a um, already recognized diagnosis in the DSM. And however, his work has not gained, um, you know, the acceptance that he would need yet for the DSM to um, accept his pathway to get there. So do you want to add anything, Monique? No, I think uh, the other, the last kind of point in terms of controversy of alienation is that there's such polarized views from parents, not only from parents, but even in the, in the professional realm, there's, there's a lot of, you know, different views that are being thrown out there. Um, with regards to the parents, you know, men will talk about, 
you know, the feminist agenda, golden uterus, or malicious mother syndrome, things like that. And you hear, you hear mothers talk about, you know, narcissistic dads and toxic masculinity. And then you've got this group of people who, who say that, you know, parental alienation doesn't exist. It's just a defense used by abusive fathers in, in order to gain, you know, custody of their children. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of controversy clouding the issue with regards to what's going on in these families. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I think the bottom line here is there's no recognized standards for diagnosing this family dynamic. And that's really um, the root of the controversy. Yeah. So what needs to change? So as we talked about um, parental alienation throughout this, this term is really a pop culture term that's, in our opinions, distracting from a diagnosis. So the whole world knows it as parental alienation, um, which is why we say pop culture term. It's kind of been used to explain a dynamic that's happening in the family but it, it's not a diagnosis is, is the real issue. So I think we need to start changing our language surrounding parental alienation to really talk about what it is, right? It's identification with the aggressor. The child is identifying um, with their abuser, their abusive uh, alienating parent. Um, you know, there's an encapsulated persecutory delusion that's going on, a shared del delusion often between the parent who is, you know, sometimes really truly believing that their their spouse is or ex-spouse is, um, you know, not worthy of being a parent to their child or, you know, is a bad person because they're also having that psychological splitting going on and then the, the child starts to absorb that that delusional narrative and they start to share in that. So um, we really need to start understanding what dynamics, what things are happening in the parent-child relationship, the enmeshment, the triangulation, um, to understand how to diagnose this. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of people trained in the world yet to do that. Um, but hopefully in time, as you know, parents are starting to awaken and the world is starting to awaken to what's going on, you know, adult children that were alienated children, so adults now, um, you know, are really starting to use their voices to speak up about what they went through, their experience, and how it has affected them long term. Um, and I think, you know, in the next 10 years, hopefully, um, you know, it's going to be like sexual abuse was 40 years ago where nobody talked about it. And now, I mean, we're all fairly educated and, and the whole world knows it's, it's horrendous, right? It's a disgusting act. And I think that's where parental alienation is going to be in, you know, hopefully 10 years. Um, so it cannot be resolved in the courtroom right now, right? We're asking judges and lawyers to resolve basically a mental health issue. Um, and they have no training. They don't understand what they're looking at. Um, the courtroom is really set up to uh, create an adversarial environment and pits the parents against each other. And, you know, they're, they're feeling the need to um, say why that parent's bad and why this parent's bad when realistically um, we need to shift the courts to less thoughts about custody and more based in, you know, a holistic therapeutic treatment and have them rule on that to support this family in repair because we are dealing with trauma. So we need to help this family to heal. The other side of the coin, aside from courts, is mental health therapists. A lot of them don't have the proper experience and training to be working with these families. And a lot of them don't even understand that they don't have the appropriate training. So, you know, you hear a lot of, uh, I mean, we're in Canada, so there's Section 211 reports or child custody assessments, um, you know, in which a mental health therapist will come in um, to assess, you know, which is the better parent for the child to be be living with, and they're not, they don't have a background in personality disorders and trauma and attachment, so they're unable to identify what the root cause of the problem is. Um, the other thing too is that these th therapists really need to be empowered to oversee the long-term treatment of the family. You know, they have to be able to 
monitor and report to the courts and and the courts have to support um, you know the 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 goals and and the treatment plan that the therapist develops and I think I mean another point is that right now you know there's a bit of a disconnect between the courts and mental health professionals and and even child protective services and we have to shift to a more collaborative approach a team approach in which you actually have a team of professionals that are working together to help this family um, I think the biggest starting point would be training you know proper training for mental health therapists teachers lawyers judges and child protective services So as Monique and I mentioned at the beginning of this, we're um, both owners of Pathways Family Coaching and Reunification. So how can we help? How can, how, how can Pathways help you if you are a parent um, dealing with this type of dynamic? Or maybe you are a friend of someone and you're starting to recognize in listening to us that perhaps your friend is going through this. Um, often people go through this for years and have no idea what what they're dealing with. Um, they have no name for it. I don't think I knew for, you know, a good 10 years what was going on in my family. So first off, we offer one-on-one -on -one coaching and consultation. So in coaching, we work with the parent to really help them to set goals and to move forward. It's very different than therapy. So in a therapeutic environment, it's a lot of, you know, talking about the past and as coaches, we like to start with a fresh slate. Today is a new day and all we can do is move forward. So we really help you to get out of that stuck place that you may find yourself in. Um, you know, that hole that parents can kind of feel like they're dug into and they can't crawl out of on their own. So we really help you to, you know, resolve some of the emotional turmoil that you're dealing with, support you um, and help you progress in your healing. And in consultation, it's more of um, strategy based. So we work one on one with mental health therapists, we work with CPS, um, we work with often with the lawyers, um, you know, anybody that you bring into your team, basically your, your, um, your team approach, we will consult with to help you strategize on, you know, what kind of treatment, what kind of therapy is really going to help your family and what needs to happen to implement that in the court system we strategize with your lawyer on you know how to get the courts to see what's going on um, and to make the right call right not to order just custody but to see that there's a need to help this family heal and that the children in the center no matter what's going on in the family dynamic really need and have a right to a relationship and to be loved by both parents so how can we help you um, and your whole family to get there with the support of the courts uh, we also offer an array of online programs. Um, you know, everything, well, I shouldn't say everything. We're still in development. We have a lot coming. Um, outlines are ready and we just need to write. Uh, but Monique, do you want to talk about a few things that we have on the go already that's out there? Yeah, I think right now, probably our signature program is called Pathways Through Conflict. And what it does is it really teaches parents, it's like a skills-based program, it teaches you skills in terms of, you know, managing your emotions and, and conflict resolution, you know, critical thinking, um, you know, skills to pass on to your children for them to, you know, develop, you know, critical thinking skills themselves so that they um, don't get pulled into this distorted narrative that, that they're being told by the alienated parent. Um, two that we're very close to releasing are ready to reconnect in the alienation code and the alienation code really takes a deep dive into what parental alienation is you know what attachment is and and you know your child's perspective and your ex-spouse's perspective because it's you know important to understand both of those whereas um, ready to reconnect is you know it's one of those courses that helps you get unstuck from that place of feeling helpless and you know takes you to a place of feeling empowered understanding and realizing that you you can make a difference and and um yeah 
Yeah, I don't know. and I think it really does help to, um, you know, overcome depression and just come out of that dark spot, dark spot, excuse me. Don't you agree, Monique? It's just really about helping uh, you on your journey of healing and getting to a really solid, stable, healthy place again. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's as, as the uh, name describes, it's getting you ready to reconnect with your kids because many parents aren't ready, right? We're destabilized, we're emotional, we're angry, um, you know, and if our kids come back to us, what are they going to come back to when you're in that state? They really need a parent that's, you know, joyous and has a rich, fulfilling life and has, you know, a lot of positives to, to give to them. So it's really necessary alienated parents that you, you work through everything that you're going through and, and get yourself really mentally healthy. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it, it's really hard to help a child heal when you haven't healed yourself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. We're, we, um, you know, we, we can't give what we don't have. So, yeah, we also have an amazing, I can't brag about this co-parenting plan enough. Um, Monique and I worked incredibly hard on this. Uh, how long is it, Monique? Like 48 pages? Yeah, something like yeah. that. It's gigantic, but um, don't be overwhelmed. It's incredibly easy to use. It's literally yes, no, check the boxes. Uh, it goes through every single minute detail that we could think of that we've ran into when coaching parents, the things that parents get into, you know, arguments about or end up in court about down to, you know, the frivolous, tiny little things. Uh, because we want you to avoid the courts, right? We want you to plan and have a solid, a solid plan in place so that your children know what's going on in their future. Um, and this helps you to avoid, you know, that argument. So um, our, our co-parenting plan, you just basically can download it, print it, um, and use it however you like. You can use it with your mediator, use it within the court, or if you're, you know, in a, a decent situation where you're amicable, can actually do the parenting plan with your ex, then great. But it can be used in, in, in numerous ways. Also, one really important thing I think that we have in there um, is that we, we have repercussions, right? That's one thing about any sort of document when you're dealing with an alienating parent they don't follow court orders. They don't follow the parenting plan. And if you don't give them a reason to do it, if they're not facing some sort of repercussion, they're not going to follow it. Right. So we have that worked right into the plan. Um, also our digital timeline service. So I'm not going to go into great details, but if anybody's dealing with, um, you know, behavioral issues, with their ex and they feel like the courts are missing the plot, they don't see what's going on, then this timeline service is fantastic for navigating the court system or even keeping you out of court. Um, you can even present this to Child Protective Services to show that, uh, you know, there is a serious issue, excuse me, and, and who and what that issue is. So basically we take a sampling of your data, your evidence, and um, we tag for patterns of behavior. Um, you know, we tag for all the top professionals, we tag for intimate partner violence, um, and something new we're going to be adding soon, which I'm incredibly excited about, is um, we're partnering with um, a, a brilliant man that is going to help us look for hallmarks for, um, you know, warning signs of filicide. So I know very scary to talk about, but a very ser serious issue and something that every alienated parent fears. So we want to help to... Um, to empower the courts to see the pattern of what's going on before before serious issues happen. Did you want to add anything to that, Monique? No, I think that's, I think, um, you know, if somebody wants to, to learn more about that, um, we'll give a, a link to our website here at the end so you can go read up a little bit more about it. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and then we're also very collaborative partners. So we firmly believe, and we've already talked about this, that it, that it treatment team approach is completely necessary, right? There's not one person out there or one group out there that can solve this for your family. It really takes, um, you know, a team with a collaborative mindset, perhaps a, a lawyer, a mental health therapist, you know, sometimes CPS is involved, um, a coach, right? It takes a group of professionals working together, strategizing and implementing to 
you know, hold your family secure and monitor the situation and to make sure that you guys are being successful. And at the end of the day, that your children are having a relationship with both their parents, however that may look like. It's very important. Yeah, and I just wanted to add, you know, we'll collaborate with, um, you know, the professionals that are part of your team now, but if you don't have a team built, we can certainly help you find the right professionals that will help your family. Yeah, absolutely. Oftentimes we have uh, parents come to us and they have professionals already involved and unfortunately they're not the right professionals and you know sometimes we can help to get them on the, the right road or we can help those professionals to make a recommendation to the people that could actually help the family um, and then if you have nobody like Monique said we can help you with interview questions and you know how to source those people and what kind of training they need. So before we end this presentation we just want to leave you with this, one of our favorite quotes, quotes by John Lennon, and it's, there are no problems, only solutions. And both Jenna and I really, really believe this. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, getting out of a reactive state of mind, which I know I was guilty of when I was kind of in the throes of, of being, being alienated from my own child and getting more into a proactive solution uh, mindset. And that's, what we're best at is, is helping you transition from one state to the set, to the other. Right. Yeah. And um, I know we spoke before about, you know, there's a lot of controversy surrounding parental alienation and there isn't really a clear path to diagnosis yet. And a lot of, I guess, discouraging things, but I, I just want to say that there are still solutions out there. The pathway is a bit, you know, jagged um, and a little harder to navigate, but that's why we work with families to help them to navigate that, you know, twisty turny road to get where they want to be and to get the right professionals involved and supporting their family so that they can get there. Absolutely. So we just want to thank you for tuning in with us today. Um, you know, if you want more information about us, um, you can go to our website at pathwaysfamilycoaching.com. Um, if you'd rather just get in touch with us personally, you know, shoot us an email at clientcare at pathwaysfamilycoaching.com. We also have Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn profiles where you can find us add more yeah. information about you know what's really going on in your family and how you can help yeah and on our on our website we have a fantastic blog too so if you're looking for uh, information um, we're trying to produce as much as we can so please take a look and hopefully it helps your family so I just want to say a huge thank you for everybody that joined us today. I hope this was helpful for your understanding um, and I hope it gives you some resources and, um, you know, information. And I, I'm so glad to be with you and share this time. So thank you again. Hi everyone, my name is Amrita and I'm asking you to join us with our online campaign against child abuse. April 25th is Parental Alienation Awareness Day. We're asking that you upload a pic of royal blue of yourself or the Parental Alienation Awareness Ribbon with the hashtags and Parental Alienation and Child Abuse. Together we can be the change that we wish to see. So we will be sure to tag everybody who has been involved in the making of this presentation on Facebook so that if you have any further questions you can contact either one of us. Thank you guys for watching. And I'd just like to add that I'd like to thank all individuals who participated in making this event possible, especially our volunteers and our guest speakers that presented for this event. And also I'd like to remind people that EPFC is here, which stands for Equal Parenting for Children. That for advocating for families, individuals, especially for children who have suffered under civil litigation and high conflict and in with um, child welfare systems. We are also advocating so that especially children have access to their families, extended families, their culture, their religion, and their identity as who they are. And this is important. As a time, especially now in a time of self-isolation and in quarantine, it's very important that we all have uh, and we all know that we have a support system, we have a community that, uh, that is there and that we have resources and especially love because in this time of, of 
aloneness that we all need uh, to feel that we have these in place because um, as results a lot of people who do not have these supports um, and these resources and love can result to uh, traumas and to also other um, psychological and emotional distress within their lives and within their community base and that's why it's important that equal parenting for children is a children's rights advocacy group that that supports um, co-parenting supports uh, extended families and we support community based um, uh, parenting for children and that um, we we are a conflict resolution based um, organization who uh, tries to find other ways and other means for dispute resolutions and to avoid um, an adversarial system within the lit uh, litigation process and find other ways to resolve high conflict and to uh, with resolve situations and not to increase um, uh, increased conflict and and increase statistics and this is why it's important that we are still working at, for individual for all of you and that you can always contact us at epfc info at gmail.com and please follow us on Facebook e epfc and on Twitter epfc5 as we will we will be posting upcoming events and um, our work and activity within the community and um, we will be also um, uh, responding to any emails and um, and we'll be there so please reach out to us and everybody stay safe and uh, stay protective and uh, I hope you enjoyed this this event and this afternoon. Thank you. Bye.